servants. Six tools we will need. This chapter that we've looked at tonight, the last chapter of John, always has a dream-like quality to me. I can't put my finger on it, but it's, it's like a dream. What it really is, is it's, it's a place where you see the overlapping of, of the unseen realm and the seen realm. You see the overlapping of the uncreated order and the created order. You see this mingling of, of uh, the powers and the perspectives of the age to come and this mundane perspective. And it's an extraordinary chapter, which I encourage you to read again. And the thing that strikes me about it is that it's especially giving to Peter, but secondarily to all the disciples, um, an orientation to how to carry on. And that's something we need, don't we? We need an orientation for how to carry on. And so I invite you to pay very careful attention to the few things I have to say. As we talk about carrying on as God's servants, six tools we will need. We begin by reading here. After this, Yeshua appeared again to the Talmudim at Lake Tiberias. Here is how it happened. Shimon Kepha and Toma, his name means twin, were together with Natanel from Cana in the Galil, the sons of Zavdai, and two other Talmudim. Shimon Kepha said, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're coming with you. They went and got into the boat, but that night they didn't catch anything. However, just as day was breaking, Yeshua stood on shore, but the Talmudim didn't know it was he. It is our normal tendency after a divine encounter to go back to business as usual. The disciples had encountered the risen Messiah. They encountered him for 40 days after the resurrection. You want to talk about divine encounter. There's never been a, a divine encounter more dramatic than this. But it is our normal tendency after a divine encounter to go back to business as usual. This is what we see here with Peter and his friends hanging out on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias and then going fishing. It's what they were used to. And it is also what happens repeatedly in our lives. The Torah teaches this too. It's not enough to have encounters with God, even dramatic ones. There is an embedded and unavoidable issue. How will our lives be different from now on? This is a decision which we must make. A different kind of life does not come from dramatic spiritual encounters. It comes from what we do with those encounters. So ask yourself this, what have you done with your own encounters with the presence of God? Did you before long go back to business as usual? Probably so. This reading considers six things we need to go on, uh, six things we need to go on with God in our lives. We've already seen the first thing. It is what I term embodied spiritual memory. We don't just carry on after dramatic encounters with God. We intentionally carry on differently. When we have a divine encounter, we must take ourselves in hand and ask and answer this question. How is my life going to be different 
as a result of this encounter, what difference uh, will this encounter make in my life from now on? That's my decision. That's your decision. That's our decision. We continue reading. He said to them, do you, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered him. He said to them, throw your net to starboard and you will catch some. So they threw in their net and there were so many fish in it that they couldn't haul it aboard. The Talmud Yeshua loved said to Kepha, it's the Lord. On hearing it was the Lord, Shimon Kepha threw on his coat because he was stripped for work and plunged into the lake. But the other Talmudim followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they stepped ashore, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Yeshua said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Shimon Kepha went up and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153 of them. But even with so many, the net wasn't torn. Yeshua said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the Talmudim dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Yeshua came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Yeshua had appeared to the Talmudim after being raised from the dead. In our story, Yeshua gives us the second thing we need, something only God can provide, sustenance in life, both physical and spiritual. We've been reading of Yeshua in Hebrews that he upholds all things by his powerful word. We must all be maintained in spiritual and physical life by the living God. We must never grow presumptuous about this. Yeshua taught his disciples to pray about this saying, give us this day our daily bread. We need it. We should ask for it. We should look for our spiritual and physical nourishment, and we should give thanks for it. Our story continues, focusing on Peter. And here we learn of the third thing we need, the third tool we need to go on with God. Focus on what is our calling. Let's see, hold on a second. After breakfast, Yeshua said to Shimon Kepha, Shimon bar Yochanan, do you love me more than these? He replied, yes, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. He said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Shimon bar Yochanan, do you love me? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. The third time he said to him, Shimon bar Yochanan, are you my friend? Shimon was hurt that he questioned him a third time. Are you my friend? So he replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I'm your friend. Yeshua said to him, feed my sheep. Yeshua is enabling Peter to focus on his calling. That is the third thing we all need if we're going to go on with God. In general, what am I supposed to be doing? We need to know that. My assumption is that I'm supposed to be teaching God's word. This is why I spend so much of my time doing so. Reading, researching, writing, videos, teaching. Such clarity will often be an educated guess, by the way. But we should all do what we can to determine what is my life supposed to be about as best I can understand. There are ways you will know. What are your natural abilities? That is, what were you born to do? What are your acquired skills? 
What have you learned to do that you do well? What are your spiritual gifts? What has God equipped you to do that brings benefit to the people of God? What kinds of responsibilities do trustworthy mentors guide you toward? What is it that you do for which people are repeatedly grateful? Such questions and their answers will help you to focus on what you ought to be about. For Peter, that focus came through a direct divine word, three times repeated. Most of us will not be so fortunate. So, close to this focus on what is to be our task is something else from which it should never be separated. Intimacy with God. Three times, the risen king of the universe, the creator and redeemer of all, asks Peter this question. Do you love me? This is a question he asks us as well. And it is rather amazing to me, the king of the universe, who is in control of all that is, wants to know if I love him. He still wants to know. And it is a question we should be asking ourselves every day. Do I love God? How do I show that love? How should I show that love? How do I contradict that love? What ought I to be doing more of? What should I avoid out of love for God? These are very hard and demanding questions. They expose us to the bone, but we need to ask this of ourselves all the time. Do I love God? There are two more tools we will need to take with us as we continue in our life with God. The next is what I call differentiated clarity. This clarity is like focus, but it also helps us to honor our calling by having clarity on what is not our calling. This is what this is. Knowing what is not your calling. Some people never reach that. There is hardly anything more valuable than gaining clarity on what is not your calling. We need to differentiate between what is our calling and what is not. We see this happening when Peter gets uncomfortable being in the spotlight and points to another of the disciples, Yochanan. We read, Kepha turned and saw the Talmud Yeshua especially loved following behind the one who had uh, leaned against him at the supper and had, had asked, who is the one who was betraying you? On seeing him, uh, sorry, on seeing him, uh, Kepha said to Yeshua, Lord, what about him? Yeshua said to him, if I want him to stay on until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, the word spread among the brothers that the, that, 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 that that Talmud would not die. However, Yeshua didn't say he wouldn't die. But simply, if I want him to stay on until I come, what is that to you? What do we get from this? In order to be occupied in your share of the Father's business, in order for me to be occupied in my share, of the Father's business. We will always need to be gaining clarity on what is not our business. I have to watch this all the time, believe me. I am constantly comparing myself to other people. I wake up comparing myself with other people. I go to bed comparing myself with other people. This is deadly and useless. The Messiah says to us what he said to Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. There's a great liberty in that and great bondage in forgetting it. One more reading. Number six. Yes, indeed. 
I tell you, when you were younger, you put on your clothes and you went where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Kepha would bring glory to God. Then Yeshua said to him, follow me. Kepha turned and saw the Tamid Yeshua especially loved following behind. We read this before. The one who had leaned against him at the supper and had asked who was the one who was betraying you. On seeing him, Kepha said to Yeshua, Lord, what about him? Yeshua said to him, if I want him to stay on until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, the word spread, etc., etc., etc. We, like Peter, must have satisfaction with our calling in life. It's not enough to know what it is. It's not enough to know what it's not. We need to be satisfied with it. I am reminded of Moses, whom God tells that he will not enter into the promised land. After 40 years of leading Israel in the wilderness, he's not going to go. He, Adonai tells him to authorize Joshua, who will lead the people there. Adonai also tells Moshe that he will soon die there on the wrong side of the Jordan. But Moshe utters not a word of complaint. He embraces satisfaction with his calling on life. We too would do well to achieve this level of maturity. Not whining, not comparing, not complaining, but embracing what God has given us to do and who he has called us to be. These are the six tools found in this passage which will help all of us and teach all of us to keep on keeping on as we continue serving God and following the pathway from this life to the next. May I be found faithful. May you be found faithful. May we all be found faithful. Father, that is our prayer. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen.